So now we are going to move on to the next talk. for very basic, simple stimuli. So, uh, things which vary in their saturation and their size, um, which have very well-defined dimensions. And compare that with other things like uh, integral dimension stimuli, such as colors varying in their saturation and their brightness and so on. And we, we had a lot of success with this. Applying the system of the uh, survivor interaction contrast, we were able to tell apart different architectures, determine in one case that separable dimensions were processed independently, uh, a lot of the time in a serial fashion, but for integral dimensions, they seem to be pulled into a single holistic channel. Of course, there is another tool that falls under the framework of systems factorial technology, another uh, characteristic of information processing models, which is how do they change when you change the workload uh, that they have to deal with? This is called uh, capacity. The idea is, is does the overall uh, rate of processing of the system slow down as you move from processing a single item to processing two items or three items and so on. Does it, does it remain unchanged, in which case you have an unlimited capacity process, or does it even speed up? Uh, so we went to our results and applied this measure, and of course it, it didn't work. So the general idea, the general link between the mental architectures and their, their capacity is such that under certain assumptions, Serial processing um, should give you a limited capacity process. And we found serial models with unlimited capacity, sometimes supercapacity. Coactive models should give you a supercapacity process, but we found coactivation uh, with limited capacity. And of course, it turned out that we had misinterpreted our experiments. We weren't dealing with a change in workload at all. 
fact, what we were dealing with was uh, a change in um, the conflict between the dimensions. Let me illustrate this with an example. So um, a simple example would be a categorization question, is a whale a mammal or a fish? Mammal, good, okay. In Australia, a lot of people say fish, and I think they're just being sarcastic. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of different attributes you could probably call to mind to attempt to categorize a whale. Um, and the two most salient properties are probably the biology of a whale, which makes it a mammal. So this gives you some information that points you to the correct answer. On the other hand, uh, whales live in an environment which makes them similar to fish. So this is a, a property which uh, gives you information and points you to an incorrect answer. So just like Mario presented the eyes, uh, Joe's eyes on Bob's face, there were two pieces of information, but they pointed you towards different responses. The eyes pointed you directly towards Joe, that was the thing you were attempting to identify, but the overall facial structure, the rest of the face, pointed you towards Bob, which was exactly correct. So there's a conflict between these two sources of information. When you think about this as a, this particular example is a conflict between some rule-based property and similarity-based property. Um, it's easy to see uh, these types of questions if you think about a, 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 another question where in fact you have congruent properties, which point you in the same direction. Is a shark a mammal or a fish? So both now the biological properties and the similarity to other things in the environment point you to the, both point you to the correct answer. So in one case we've got incongruent or conflicting information, which makes this question hard. And here you have congruent information, which makes this particular question easier. So the goal of this particular talk is to understand um, why and how conflict interferes with decision making. Now it's, it's well known that when you have conflicting sources of information, this slows down your response time. Um, it has also relatively little effect on error, though in some cases it can have a large effect on error. The relative effects on these two dependent variables are much stronger for response time than for accuracy. The second goal of this talk, after we understand kind of why and how conflict interferes with decision making, is to see whether or not we can use this type of conflicting information to develop novel contrasts between different processing architectures. So, Previously, in thinking about these things in terms of capacity, we found some sort of predictions which didn't make a lot of sense. If we change the way we think about things, instead of thinking about capacity, if we start thinking about uh, conflict uh, in these particular situations, can we um, get back that type of diagnosticity from this type of measure? And then I'll show you some data which shows the fact that we can do that. So um, the previous example I used uh, kind of contrasted our rule-based evidence and similarity-based evidence, but we can contrast um, evidence which is just based on two different rules. So this, this type of categorization problem is very similar to the one that Mario just told you about. Uh, we've got a, a one L-shaped category boundary here. We've got two dimensions which have to do with the height and the width of these uh, rectangles. One of these rectangles belongs to category one because it has a uh, height n that which is greater than uh, this boundary, the horizontal boundary, and a width which is greater than this vertical boundary. And all the other re uh, rectangles belong to category uh, two because in fact they've got uh, a width which is uh, less than some boundary on this dimension and a height which is less than some boundary on this dimension. Now, if I highlight this particular Stimulus. You can see that the height is small, so it correctly satisfies the rule for category two. So if you just looked at height, that would give you some good information about the correct category. But the width is, is large, uh, so it incorrectly satisfies the rule for category one. So it doesn't satisfy both of these boundaries, so it doesn't belong to category one, but it does satisfy one of the boundaries, so it's providing you with conflicting information. One of the dimensions tells you it's category two, the other one tells you it's category one. So how, there are a number of different theories of categorization which we might use to explain this. I'm just going to tell you about one of them. This is a, a very prominent theory in the exemplar-based random walk model. The idea is whenever you're shown one of these stimuli and you have to assign it to a category, the way in which you do that is by retrieving exemplars from memory based on their similarity to uh, the object that you're trying to categorize. Um, this process continues for a while, and uh, once you've accumulated enough 
retrieved exemplars from one category um, relative to the other category, you uh, omit that category as an answer, the one which you retrieve more exemplars from. Now, when you've got items which have conflicting information, the retrieved exemplars are in fact similar, uh, the, the probe is in fact similar to both categories, so you end up retrieving information from both categories, um, leading you to a kind of an equivocal response, which is it takes you longer uh, to omit the correct decision. If you've got a congruent source of information, so something like this item, where both of the dimensions satisfy the rules for that category, then you tend to retrieve examples which are similar only to the correct category, um, leading you to make a faster decision. So that's one theory uh, which can explain this type of conflict. Here's another type of uh, situation where conflict has been studied in literature. These are uh, another basic psychological task, three tasks actually, which have to do with um, stimulus response congruency. So the extent to which the response you have to make is uh, congruent with the information in the stimulus. Um, uh, one famous example of this is the Stroop test, where you have to name the uh, color of the word with, but ignore the actual uh, word itself. So in this type of task, uh, saying the word, uh, determining the color of the word red whenever it is printed in red is much faster than determining the color, uh, responding to the correct color green when the color green is actually, um, or whenever the word red is printed in green. It's even hard to talk about. <laughs> uh, this task is a related task. It's called the Simon uh, task, uh, named after the, uh, one of the first guys to use it. In this particular task, the color of the cue and the shape of the cue um, tell you which particular uh, hand you're meant to respond with. So if it's a green triangle, you should respond with your left hand. If it's a red star, you should respond with your right hand. Now, whenever you have uh, a green triangle shown on the left-hand side, you're faster and more accurate um, than if you have a green uh, triangle presented on the right-hand side. When you've got a congruency between what the stimulus is telling you to do and what you actually have to do, you're faster than whenever the stimulus is uh, on the opposite side. Another example of this task would be something like the spatial flanker task, where you have to respond either left or right based on the direction of this arrow. Uh, and uh, the arrow might be um, surrounded by some flanking arrows which either point in the same direction uh, or a neutral direction or the opposite direction. Again, you're much faster whenever they provide you with congruent information than incongruent information. Uh, typically, in these tasks, the, the center arrow that you're meant to uh, respond to while ignoring the flankers isn't highlighted in the manner done here. I just thought that so you can see um, the congruency. So here's another model that's been designed to explain the Simon task, but it can also, uh, you can think about how it would apply to these other tasks. In this particular model, uh, the stimuli, such as cue color and uh, location, are represented in a uh, multi-dimensional space. So here you've got the um, location of the cue, and here you've got the color of the cue. These values are projected onto a decision axis, and the, the orientation of this decision axis moves around, representing how much attention you're giving to each of these dimensions. And because it's variable, the representation of the stimuli, so a green triangle on the left, ends up being variable. And um, the decision is made by comparing these decision axes to some criterion which separates each of the responses, and then effectively, once you've uh, uh, projected, each of the stimuli onto this decision axis, you are left with signal detection theory, um, the type of prediction, the reason why you get faster responses for congruent items is because they provide you with much clearer evidence of the response uh, that you have made. More of the distribution, uh, the distribution is much closer to the response that you're actually supposed to admit. 